Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in the book of Jeremiah, and if you are visiting, we are doing studies in Jeremiah, taking select passages. We're not going chapter by chapter, but just uh, different select passages. And the, this morning, we're in chapters 37 and 38. And I'm not going to read all of uh, both chapters. Uh, in fact, we're not going to spend a lot of time in verse in chapter 37, but I'm going to read part of chapter 38. I'll verse, read verses 1 through 13. Before I do, I want to explain a term that we find uh, throughout the, uh, the portion of Scripture that we'll look at, and that is the word Chaldeans. And some of you may know who that refers to. The, certainly the context of the passage would inform you that it's a reference to the Babylonians. But this is an old term. When Nebuchadnezzar established the kingdom that he had, he inherited it from his father nabo Palasser, but it was Nebuchadnezzar that expanded it to a great empire, and he's the one that built the great city of Babylon. That is technically called the Neo-Babylonian Empire because there was an old Babylonian Empire and it's the kingdom of the Chaldeans, which was mainly the southern part of Mesopotamia. Nebuchadnezzar came from that region. Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldeans. So it's an old term, but it came to be used synonymously with the Babylonians. And so we'll see it in our readings and it's a reference to the Babylonians. Well, let's begin with chapter 38, verse 1. Now, Shephatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, and Eucal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was speaking to all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, he who stays in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Then the official said to the king, now let this man be put to death inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are in this city and all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. So King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now the cistern, now in the cistern there was no water, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. But Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, while he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the cistern. Now the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin, and ebed Melech went out from the king's palace and spoke to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the cistern, and he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city." Then the king command, commanded ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take thirty men from here under your authority, and bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. So ebed Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn out clothes and worn out rags and let them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Now put these worn out clothes and rags under your arms, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. 
May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. A few weeks ago, I referred to Pilgrim's Progress. I refer to it frequently, I think. One of the finest characters in it doesn't appear until near the end of the story. Great Heart was leading some pilgrims to the celestial city when he meets Valiant for Truth. He was standing in the path with a sword and covered in blood. He had just fought a battle against three enemies who had tried to make him leave his journey and join them. That was Jeremiah. He preached the message God gave him in an age of unbelief. The Babylonians were coming. It was a message of judgment and not popular. Others were preaching a different message. They gave the positive prophecy of peace, peace, not doom. And that was the message people wanted to hear, a message of peace. But Jeremiah didn't join them. He didn't turn away from the message that God gave him. And so things were hard for the prophet. And as time passed, they only got harder. Early in the book, in chapter 11, the people of his hometown of Anatoth, people that he had grown up with, his friends, threatened to kill him if he didn't keep quiet. That was the life of a prophet. They were valiant for truth, covered with blood, sword in hand. It's the life of a Christian today if we speak the truth and live the truth. People don't want that. They want a positive message, which we have. In fact, we alone have the message of grace and hope and eternal life but it is a message that comes through the message of sin and guilt and judgment. In order to give the cure, we must explain the condition. But man, by nature, rebels against that. He wants to hear peace, not punishment. It was no different in Jeremiah's day. People wanted him to join the false prophets. They wanted to hear him preach peace. And if they didn't preach that, If he didn't preach that, they wanted him to keep quiet. And Jeremiah didn't keep quiet. Back in chapter 19, we read that he stood in the temple one day and he prophesied God's word. Behold, I'm about to bring on this city and all its towns the entire calamity I have declared against it. Pasher the priest heard it and had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in stocks public humiliation. Things only got worse. He went from the stocks to the prison. Just when his prophecy was coming true, that there would be no peace, when the Babylonians were there at the gates of the city, and he was vindicated, he was put in prison in chapter 32. Later in chapter 37, he went from the prison to a dungeon Then in chapter 38, things reached their lowest point, literally, when Jeremiah was put in a deep, dark pit. Well, that was life for a prophet in Israel. Chapter 37 gives us the period in which this happened. Told in verse 1 that it was during the time of Zedekiah, the king of Judah. He's the last king of Judah. At that time, there was a temporary reprieve in hostilities. The Babylonians had been at the gates of Jerusalem, but they withdrew at this point in order to fight the Egyptians. Jeremiah warned the people not to be deceived into thinking that the Babylonians were gone and that the danger had passed. They would return to fight against Jerusalem and they would burn it with fire. That's verse 10 of chapter 37. For even if you had defeated the entire army of Chaldeans, 
who were fighting against you, and there were only wounded men left among them, each man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. God's will cannot be thwarted, and it's foolish to fight it. Now that was what they wanted to do, that is what they did, and this is not what they wanted to hear. He was robbing them of their hope, which was a false hope that they harbored. So Jeremiah was arrested on grounds of treason, accused of collaborating with the Babylonians. They beat him and put him in jail, what's described in verse 16 as a dungeon, where they left him for many days and where he would have died, except King Zedekiah had mercy and brought him out. Chapter 37 ends with Jeremiah imprisoned in the guardhouse and where he was given a loaf of bread each day. And that was some relief for him. But if they hoped that his time in the dungeon might have convinced him to keep quiet, they were disappointed. Jeremiah felt the pain of all of that. You can imagine being in a dungeon in those days where there would have been no amenities at all, being there for many days, weeks, coming to the point of near death, you would have felt the pain, no doubt felt the terror of it. All of that, though, did not stop him from doing his responsibility as a prophet, carrying out his ministry, proclaiming his message. Earlier, in chapter 20, after he had been publicly beaten, mocked, released from the stocks, he was dejected, as you might expect. But he couldn't stop preaching. In fact, he said it was like a fire shut up in his bones that he couldn't hold in. He couldn't help but preach. And so again, Jeremiah was at it, prophesying, but his message given in chapter 38 here not only foretold defeat, it also counseled surrender. Verse 2 and 3, Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. And that's not the kind of message that they wanted to hear. It's not the kind of message we want to hear. Surrender? It goes against the grain. It, it contradicts our notions of patriotism and courage. We like Churchill, who when his government wanted to sue for peace with Hitler, chose a different path. He told his cabinet, England would fight. And he ended his speech, if this long island story of ours is to end at last, let it end only when each one of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. Wow. Now that gets the blood up. Makes a person want to fight. It, it makes us want to stand up and cheer. In fact, that's what his cabinet did. They stood and they cheered him. Jeremiah's speech of surrender and stay alive, not, not so much. But they are two very different speeches. Both were right for the time and the people. A nation must defend its shores from invasion. It needs a wise, strong leader to direct it in a hard path. Jeremiah was doing that for Judah. He was being both patriotic and prophetic. Surrender was God's will for his people. Babylon was his rod of discipline. And his will was for Judah to submit to it. The right analogy here is not political, but spiritual. It's not between nations, but spiritual people. Israel is God's chosen nation. The ap that application here is to God's elect, believers, to the church. The lesson for us is about how we are to respond to divine discipline. 
And the answer is we're to yield to it, not rebel against it. So our inclination is to rebel against something that, that, that causes us discomfort or, or seeks to move us in a way we don't want to go. We rebel, but the lesson here is that's foolish. Rebellion never, never is successful against the Lord. Now that's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to counsel a person to do, to, to tell a person that, that he or she needs to stop bad behavior. Not diff- that's not easy. That's difficult. But that's doing the work of Jeremiah today. He lived in a different dispensation. He spoke to Israel's leaders. It's kings and priests and prophets, so-called because they were uh, the, the, the spiritual leaders of God's flock, the nation Israel. He addressed them because they were the shepherds, so to speak. And God's solution for their spiritual condition their, their rebellion against Him, their sinful behavior, their idolatry, their immorality and dishonesty and all of the, the apostasy that characterized them was the discipline of Babylon. That's the solution. They needed to submit to that and repent. So all through this book, he's calling them to repentance. But the men of Judah, the leaders and generals, were of a very different mind. They thought they should fight till they were choking in their own blood. And they thought Jeremiah was a defeatist. They complained in verse 4. Then the official said to the king, Now let this man be put to death inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in this city. For this man is not, and all the people, by, seeking, by speaking such words, for this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. Now don't we hear that today? If we denounce certain behaviors as sin and destructive, and if they are behaviors that are sinful, they are always destructive. If we do that, we're accused of being intolerant and hateful, seeking people's harm, not their well-being. Truth is, whenever we speak truth and speak it in love as we are to do, we are seeking a person's well-being. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. People can be on the wrong path and really believe they're on the right path. It's what they want to do. It's how they are going to be fulfilled, they think. But it's the wrong path if it's contrary to the Word of God. Jeremiah was directing his nation off the way of death and doing so out of love. But they didn't want to hear it. They said he was discouraging the soldiers and the city from from fighting, and they they wanted him put to death. So, again, no one listened to him, and his life was threatened. King Zedekiah, who had shown some courage when he fetched Jeremiah from the dungeon and provided for him in the guardhouse, listened to these men and caved into their demands. Verse 5, So King Zedekiah said, Behold, is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. Well, that wasn't true. In fact, he took steps against their action later in verse 10. But Zedekiah was a weak man. He, he knew what was right, but he feared men. He had no faith, and he, he vacillated. In a way, you, you can't help but pity this man. He, he had no backbone, no courage. He could not endure hardship, and so he gave in to the demands of influential men. And I know that's something that some of you probably face, that challenge of being around some influential people who want you to do something contrary to what you know is right, and that's a hard thing to resist. Very hard for this man to resist because he was weak. A man who lacked faith, and so he vacillated. So he gave them over, gave Jeremiah over to these men who treated him quite roughly. They put the prophet in a cistern in the courthouse, in the courtyard of the guardhouse. 
And cisterns were dug into the limestone rock, which is very prevalent in Jerusalem and all of Judea. And it was a place to, to collect and store rainwater. They were usually dug in a, in a kind of pear shape with the, the, a small opening at the top that could be covered. Uh, this cistern was probably not in use. It was empty of water, but had a deposit of mud at the bottom. Jeremiah was lowered into that. And verse 6 states that he sank into the mud. I uh, read this and I wonder if Jeremiah was claustrophobic. And I would wonder that. Uh, if that were so, then it, it must have been a terrifying thing. It would have been uh, my worst nightmare, I can assure you. What went through his mind, you wonder, as he was lowered down that narrow opening into that dark pit? He must have wondered what was at the bottom, and then as his feet touched the mud, wondered how deep it was, and as he sank into it, wondered how far deeply he would sink. When the opening was covered and the pit closed in on him, and he sat there in the mud, and darkness, he was all alone with only his thoughts. And that can be very dangerous. Why am I here, he must have thought. What did I do? I know what I did. I preached the message that God gave me. I was faithful to him. And, and for that, I'm in a muddy, dark pit. And who knows what other things are crawling around in here with me. Now this is when Satan's fiery darts begin to hit and sting. Earlier in chapter 20, after he had been mocked and mistreated, Jeremiah despaired and he cursed the day of his birth, regretted that he'd even been born. Things got to him, just as they do to us. The man was a hero of the faith. One of those referred to in Hebrews 11, where the author of Hebrews writes of those who experience mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment, of whom the world was not worthy. That, that expression covers a whole range of people whose names we don't even know. But you can be sure Jeremiah was one of those of whom the world was not worthy. But he was a man. And one of the things we see very much in this book of Jeremiah is the personal nature of it. We get a peek into his emotional life, into his inner life, more than any other prophet. And we, we recognize he was a man who faced all of the temptations and weaknesses that are common to man. And there in that, that grim place, he must have wondered if he were forgotten and would die there. Well, years earlier, Back in chapter 1, when God called him to be a prophet, he said he would make Jeremiah as a pillar of iron and as walls of bronze against the world and to the kings of Judah. Impregnable. Well, he might have wondered about that promise. Where was God in all of this? Had the Lord abandoned him? Well, we can only imagine what he thought, what went through his head. But... This is the result of faithfully standing for the truth. We should know that. God has not promised you and me and any child of God an easy path through life. Not at all. Very often, this is the life of service. It is against the darkness, and the darkness hates the light, and it tries to overcome the light. That's John chapter 1, verse 5. That's John chapter 3, verse 19. Now, we can only imagine what he thought, but this is the result of a faithful ministry. This is the result of standing for the truth. Very often, this is the life of service, as I say. Now, the, the, the darkness fights against us. It opposes us. It tries to snuff out the light. And in doing that, while it cannot succeed, nevertheless, it can succeed in wearing us down physically and emotionally, psychologically. Now that seems strange, I think, to some people. 
to say this about a prophet of God, to say this about a man of God. How can, how can a man of God get discouraged? Well, the reason is, this is about real people. This is the reality of life. We, we are all in a battle. We're in a spiritual conflict. We're in an invisible war that never lets up. It's not easy. The Apostle Paul spoke of being afflicted, of having fears and great sorrow, even despairing of life. It will happen to anyone who lives earnestly for the truth, who lives for the gospel. Francis Schaeffer, who many of you will remember from books they wrote back in the 70s and the 80s. Um, I don't know how well he's remembered now, but he was quite a popular writer in those days. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book that I read when I was in college at that 1970. The title of it is Death in the City. Its main subject is Jeremiah. He deals with other things. He deals a lot with the book of Romans and the Gospel and the Apostle Paul, but his main character study is Jeremiah. And he wrote on this subject of Jeremiah's discouragement. He wrote, it's possible to be faithful to God and yet to be overwhelmed with discouragement as we face the world. In fact, if we are never overwhelmed, I wonder if we are fighting the battle with compassion and reality or whether we are jousting with paper swords against paper windmills. If you love God and love men and have compassion for them, he wrote, you will pay a real price psychologically. Well, Jeremiah did. It all took a toll on him. He was the weeping prophet. His tears were mostly for the nation and the lost. He wept over a fallen, destroyed Jerusalem, as well as for his own pain. Still, in spite of the disappointment, people not listening, people despising him, people attacking him, still he didn't quit. He continued on. That's what the Lord expects of us. As Schaefer stated later in his book, the Lord doesn't scold us for getting tired or discouraged. He understands. But neither does He expect us to quit. He expects us to continue on faithfully and He will supply. In fact, He always supplies. He supplies before we even realize He's supplying it. His supply is what moves us in His service. And His supply, which is faithful, keeps us in His service. Even when we're at the lowest point and it seems like the tank is empty. No, He always supplies. So we're to go forward. And what we can know is the Word of God with which He has equipped us, and that's the weapon that He's given us. No other weapon. He's given us the Word of God. That weapon, that Word is sufficient. I think the great problem in the evangelical church today is they don't believe that. No, the Word of God is not sufficient. We need to do things. We have ways of doing that that will, that will uh, make our mission more acceptable. No, the Word of God is sufficient. It's our sword, as I say, and it is effective. It is alive and powerful. It will enter hearts that have been, been prepared like seed falling on good ground. It will bear fruit. Now that's a testimony of the Word of God. As the prophet said in Isaiah 55 verse 11, it will not return to the Lord empty. Always be successful. We are well armed to do the work. We must keep at it, even though it's hard. We must persevere. It will pay off. And really, the world won't take us seriously, it won't take our gospel seriously, if the trials are too difficult for us and the opposition too strong and we don't stick with it. We must persevere. God has given believers in Christ a great gift. He has given us light in this dark world. He has given us the truth of His Word which is life-changing, which is eternal truth. And He's given us the understanding 
the faith to receive it and use it. But doing that, using it, is costly. It requires obedience and a defense before the world, and that means that we will sometimes suffer for our faith, be cut off from friends and family for our loyalty to Christ above all things and loyalty to His truth. But if we are to keep on with it, as I say, we will have difficulties. Paul did. He describes his sufferings for the gospel in 2 Corinthians 11. In fact, I think as I was thinking about this, the book of 2 Corinthians is very much like the book of Jeremiah in that Paul tells us a lot about his life in this book and a lot of the difficulties that he went through externally and internally. But in chapter 11, he speaks of being beaten by the Jews and beaten by the Gentiles, exposed to the elements and dangers at sea and on land, sleepless, hungry, thirsty, but he didn't quit. In fact, earlier in the book, in uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, verse 8, he writes, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing. Brought to the end of himself almost, but not to the end. He keeps going. I was reading about Martin Luther that when he was preaching one time, he got word of the first Protestant martyrs. Some monks had read his works. They had embraced it. They had uh, uh, began teaching the scriptures. And they were burned alive in the Grand Square in Brussels. There's a, a marker there today that, that uh, marks the spot this occurred. Well, when, when, when Luther heard this, he began to walk the floor and he said, I can't go on. I can't do it anymore. Because of me, other men are being killed. I can't go on. Then as, as he struggled with this, he came to an understanding that because it was truth, no matter what the cost to him or anyone else, he must go on. And he did. Well, Jeremiah may well have questioned himself and his mission. Those kind of things enter our minds when things are difficult. And even uh, the, the, certainly when he sits in this dark, damp pit, he must have thought or perhaps he thought that the Lord was not with him. But in time, he learned that uh, that was not the case. If that, if that did, in fact, trouble him, he realized he found that he was not alone and he was not forgotten. In his mercy, the Lord turned the heart of the king's servant in Jeremiah's favor. Ebed Melech was his name. That means servant of the king, which is a title, not really a name. He's called a saurus in Hebrew. That's the Hebrew word. And it refers to a eunuch very often. In fact, it's translated that way here. It's not always that. Uh, could simply mean a, a, an official of some kind in the court of the king. But we really know very little about this man, Ebed Melech. He was an Ethiopian, literally a man of Cush. So he was a black African. He was a Gentile, a son of Ham, who was more righteous than the sons of Shem, more righteous than the men of Judah. He was a brave man. He was great heart. He risked his life to approach the king and intercede on behalf of God's prophet. This is a man God had done a work of grace in. He was one of the remnant. And he accused the men who had taken Jeremiah and placed him in that terrible place of acting wickedly. Zedekiah was sitting in the gate of Benjamin holding court settling evidently some legal dispute. This is where the court was held, where matters of, uh, of justice were established. While he's sitting there, Ebed Melech approached him and said in verse 9, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into, that, into the cistern 
and he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. Well, men were put to death for such statements as that. But he had a concern for Jeremiah, and he risked his life, regardless of the great differences between the men. Zedekiah was again convicted, and Jeremiah, had, and he had Jeremiah removed. He ordered Ebed-Melech to take 30 men and bring him up, which again shows the indecisive nature of this king, putting him there, bringing him out. Still, it was right what he did. And under the, the, the truthful statements of this servant, he was convicted and he acted. And we read in verse 13, so they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Nothing said about Jeremiah's enemies, about those men that put him there, but evidently the Lord who delivered Jeremiah kept the enemies from acting. He, uh, as it were, shut the mouths of the lions while at the same time moving upon the heart of his servant, Ebed Melech. It was Psalm 40, verse 2. He brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. The Lord takes care of his servants. That doesn't mean he doesn't allow us to pass through deep waters and fire and storm and all the difficulties of life but he takes care of his servants. It's what Whitfield said, what he wrote in his journal. I find that we are immortal till our work is done. And so it is. That's the case. God protects us, and he provides for us. King Zedekiah met with Jeremiah secretly. He wanted to know if the prophet had a word from the Lord. Do not hide anything from me, he said. Well, that's, that sounds good. Jeremiah, though, was suspicious. He, he knew the king hadn't listened to him in the past, had no reason to believe he'd listen to him now, but, but he asked him to guarantee that he would not put him to death. And Zedekiah assured him that it would be okay. So in verses 17 and 18, he told him that if he surrendered, all would go well. This city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. The message hadn't changed. The dungeon and the pit had not persuaded Jeremiah to trim his sails and to join the false prophets with a pleasant sermon of peace. Once again, Jeremiah was valiant for truth. And if Zedekiah had listened to the prophet rather than to the patriots so-called, he could have saved the city and saved himself. So it is. If we'll listen to the Word of God, however difficult that may seem, we will be blessed. But Zedekiah was too weak to do that. He wanted to know if there was a word from the Lord, not because he was looking for the truth, but because he was hoping that it had changed to suit his wishes. I think sometimes that's what people do. They want counsel so that they can have a new word. Maybe, maybe I'll finally hear what I want to hear. And that was, that was Zedekiah. No, Jeremiah had only one message for him. And this man, Zedekiah, feared men more than God. He thought surrender would result in his murder at the hands of his own people. They would uh, look down on him. They would despise him for surrendering to the enemy. He said, I dread the Jews. Jeremiah reassured him that would not happen. Please obey the Lord, he said. And you can just, just you can see that, that in spite of, of the 
the, the king's weakness, that Jeremiah had a real concern for him, for this weak king who's put him in the dungeon, put him in the, let him be put in the cistern. Nevertheless, he has a real concern for him. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.14 to speak the truth in love. And, and Jeremiah did that. He, he wept over his nation from love. And here he pleads with the king from love. He'd be safe, he said, if he obeyed. If he didn't, he would be mocked as a foolish king. In fact, he speaks of that in verse 22, that the women of the palace will, will ridicule him. Then behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And those women will say, your close friends have misled and overpowered you while your feet were sunk in the mire. They turned back. Having one's feet stuck in mud may have been a, a kind of a well-known expression in that time for being indecisive. Maybe it was a play on words for, uh, with uh, Jeremiah in the cistern, but it, it gives a good picture of the consequences of unbelief. People are, are intransigent in their unbelief. They think it's foolish to believe. They think it's folly to turn away from unbelief. But what he's pointing out here is the end result of unbelief for the unbeliever is is shame, being covered in shame and ridicule, humiliation. That was one of the problems that Zedekiah would have as a result. Zedekiah's only response to this was to express concern for himself. He told Jeremiah not to tell anyone uh, about the content of their conversation or, or Jeremiah would die. Well, Jeremiah didn't. He didn't divulge the conversation. And Zedekiah kept his word to the prophet. But his disobedience to God would result in a very tragic end for this king and for his family. He rejected the prophet's word. Again, it's foolish to reject the word of God regardless of, of the circumstances. Now to us as Christians, that, that is astonishing. It's astonishing as you read this and you reflect upon it. Here, Zedekiah was surrounded by the most powerful army in the world. The city was starving. There was no bread left in it, according to Ebed Melech. His situation was utterly hopeless. He didn't need a prophet to tell him what was going to happen, really. Things were obvious. But Jeremiah did tell him, and Jeremiah had a track record. He'd been proven true every time, and yet this king rejected the message. That is the power of faith, or rather of fear and unbelief. That's what a, what, what a strong grip that it has on the unbeliever. It takes sovereign grace to overcome that, which it does through the truth. Now, the truth is hard. And when I say the truth, I mean the revelation of God. It is difficult. It, it makes us face realities about ourselves that we don't want to see. But it is right and it is fair. And as I said already, it always blesses those who obey. Christians have the truth. We have the good news. We need to guard it. We need to use it. In a world of darkness and hostility, we will do that at a cost. We should know that. But the Lord is with us always, and He will bless us, and He will reward us. At the end of Pilgrim's Progress, each pilgrim received an invitation from the king in the celestial city to dine with him, each in his turn, one by one, they left the company of the pilgrims. They crossed the river and they entered the celestial city. It's a picture of death, of leaving this world, of entering heaven and the world to come, in which at the moment we do, we, we come face to face with our Lord and we have deep personal fellowship with Him. When Valiant for Truth was given his invitation, he said goodbye to his companions. His farewell was... My sword I give to him who shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him who can get it. 
My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. That reminds me of, reminds me of the conclusion of Paul's book to the Galatians, a book in which he defends the gospel against error, and it's a book of, uh, of strong emotion as you read it. Because he's defending the gospel that has bewitched the, uh, against a false gospel that has bewitched these Galatians that he loves so much. And the gospel was that, that the, the, the false gospel that was given was faith in Christ, but not faith alone. Faith plus some work. Faith plus some ceremony. Faith plus because Christ isn't sufficient. And Paul took the strongest angle against that. He said, let those men, those false prophets, those false teachers, those false evangelists, be accursed. Go to hell, is what he's saying. And so we come to the end of the book, and he says in verse 16 of chapter 6, let no one cause trouble for me. Don't give me any trouble over this. For I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. Those were the scars that he got from the beatings and the scourgings and the stonings that he went through in his fight for the truth. They were proof that he fought Christ's battles. So let no one cause trouble for me. Well, he took those scars into eternity to the throne of God as Jeremiah took his testimonies to faithfulness in the spiritual battle that we are all in. There are badges of courage. May we not be afraid to get marks and scars for Christ. And I'm preaching to myself more than you. But may we not be afraid to get marks and scars for Christ. What a disappointing thing it will be to enter heaven undented from this life. May God save us from that, from our fear, and make us all valiant for truth. If you're here without the truth, if you're here without the gospel, without Jesus Christ, we invite you to come to Him, which is to say we invite you to believe in Him. You're really no different from Zedekiah. You are in a hopeless situation, doomed to the grave. That's the end of it all for all of us, the grave. Why would you die lost without hope? Christ offers you life. Escape from the eternal pit of darkness. Come to Him. He obtained that escape on the cross for all who trust in Him when He paid for our sins through His death for us. He died in our place. Turn to Him. Trust in Him and live. May God help you to do that and help all of us to be valiant for truth. We have the message of hope. And that's a good way for us to end with a hymn about hope. Let's turn in the Songs of Praise book to hymn number 31, There is a Hope. Let's stand and sing and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 31. Father, we do give You praise for the hope that we have. We praise You because it's Your doing, not ours. We give You thanks for it because it's ours only through Your sovereign grace, through the work of Your Son who purchased that hope, that life to come for us. We possess it now. We have eternal life now through faith in Him, but we have a glorious future before us. Our hope, may we live in light of that and serve you faithfully in the present. We thank you for Christ. Thank you for your goodness and grace to us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.